I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking to you about electronic fetal monitors or the EFMs. Um, we're going to spend some time talking about this um, over the, during this voiceover and there are also links at the very end of the presentation of YouTube videos that will give um, a more in-depth look at um, what to do when your fetal monitor tracing doesn't look good. It'll talk about accelerations and decelerations. And so you can um, either link up to them from this voiceover, or you can also go to your ICCOC homepage, and they are already embedded in Unit 4 um, under lecture. So you can find the, um, that information there as well. So when you go into the hospital, if you've never had a baby and if you've never set foot on an OB or labor and delivery unit, this is typically what you're going to see. You will see an external fetal monitor over here. Um, and basically there are two cords that run from it. Um, the top one is the ultrasound trans, or, I'm sorry, the top one is the tocometer and the toco detects the frequency and duration of uterine contractions and the bottom is the ultrasound transducer and that's going to be responsible for um, hearing fetal heartbeat and tracing the fetal heart rate and that information correlates over here then to this fetal monitoring strip and the top part of the strip represents fetal heart rate the bottom part represents uterine contractions there are also a couple of other little areas on the external fetal monitor utilizing um, blood pressure cuff, pulse oximeter, um, telemetry, or heart monitoring. So you will see a couple of other different things um, on there as well. When you are using the external fetal monitor, it's important to use ultrasonic gel when you put the, um, the monitor on the mother. And then when you connect the mom's cords up to the external fetal monitor right here. What you will do is they are color coded so you will be able to um, put the cords in the right place and really not be able to mess that up. So it's kind of a very ideal situation. So again this is a close-up of what you will see. So if they, these two determine, determine uh, fetal heart rates, so when you're looking at those, those will read out on the top part of your external fetal monitor and this other cord is utilized for the um, TOCO or determining the frequency and durations of uterine contractions. It's important to remember when we are talking about external fetal monitors, external fetal monitors are going to go on top of mom's tummy. They are external. So the um, transducer is um, on the top as you can see up here sensing uterine contractions and then the transducer um, over here is utilized for detecting fetal heart rate. When you hook a mother up to the external fetal monitor it's important to palpate her fundus so you are putting that um, uterine contraction transducer on the upper portion um, so that it can determine frequency and duration of uterine contractions only. There are also internal monitors. Internal monitors will hook up to your system uh, the same way as the external fetal monitors. However, they um, are inserted internally into the mother. So in order to have internal fetal monitors, the mother has to have a ruptured bag of water. She has to be dilated to two centimeters because what will happen is that these monitors will go inside the vagina up in through the cervix. The um, fetal scalp lead right here, this is attached to the baby's head. It looks like a little coil. We will bring those into class and you'll be able to see those and have some an opportunity to look at those. The fetal scalp electrode detects the fetal heart rate. So you can take the external monitors off, put your internal ones in. Um, with the internal monitors, they're much more sensitive than the external monitors, so that is one great thing. Also with the internal monitors, if you have a mom that is overweight or as I call a little bit fluffy, the internal monitors do detect um, tracings much nicer than the external fetal monitors, but like I said, we're only using them when she's ruptured, we're only using them when she's dilated two centimeters. Also important to remember if she is ruptured, then we have a source for bacteria and infection. So you're not always going to see these utilized. Typically you're going to see them in situations where we can't monitor very well. 
You're going to see them when we're using Pitocin because we want to be able to determine the strength of uterine contractions. So with the in internal monitors, the internal monitors can tell us the specific strength of uterine contractions. External only going to tell us frequency duration. Internal is going to tell us frequency duration and strength of those uterine contractions. So that's one really wonderful thing about the internal monitors. The downside is that it does leave us um, a, a, you know, leaves the mother and the fetus susceptible to infection. So when she has these internal monitors on, typically maybe she'll have an epidural and won't be getting up to go to the restroom. But if she has internal monitors in, doesn't have pain medication on, on board, and is going to the restroom, it's important to um, discuss hygiene so that we are decreasing risk for infection to her and to that fetus. This is a sample of the external fetal monitor strip. Um, so the, as I've said, the top portion up here is going to be utilized to trace the fetal heart rate. If you have twin pregnancies or multi, multiple pregnancies, you'll see one dark line as you see here, and then you'll also see a lighter line that will represent the second baby. And then down on the bottom portion, as you can see, time is typically documented across here. Each dark line that you see here, 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 those dark lines represent one minute of time, so each small box is 10 seconds. Um, the contractions are these lower bumps right down here. So you can see contraction, contraction. So that is what you'll be looking at when you're looking at fetal monitoring tracings. Other things that we need to talk about, fetal monitor patterns, and we will talk about these in class as well, but this gives you just a brief overview. So when you're looking at fetal monitoring patterns, what we're looking for is a reassuring fetal pattern. A reassuring fetal pattern determines fetal well-being. So when we see a fetal heart rate that has accelerations and no decelerations, is falling in between the normal range of 120 to 160 beats per minute. And I'm sorry, I think your book says 110 to 160. But when you're seeing a nice reassuring fetal heart rate, that's when you can, um, that's when we talk about a reassuring pattern. When you have late decelerations, as you see over here, um, loss of variability is not good. When we talk about variability, variability are like the bumps that you see that kind of run along. This is an acceleration. You'll see it come down and then you kind of see bumps moving along again in here. That's variability. When you lose variability, that fetal heart rate looks very smooth. You don't see many bumps. You don't see much going on. In this particular situation, you have late decelerations. A late deceleration is the fetal heart rate that legs behind the contractions or it comes after the peak of the contraction. Um, when you see this persistent late deceleration and um, decreased variability, it's very ominous. Not very great outcomes are associated with that baby. When you're looking at variable decelerations, um, you, variable, you have your variability here, so you see it bouncing up and down, moving along, moving along, but then you see these decelerations. So with variable decelerations, um, they're variable in duration, in intensity, and timing. So you have an acceleration, deceleration, acceleration, and that's typically what you'll see when you see cord compression um, or decompression of the, of the baby's umbilical cord. So you also see these little things here, they're called shouldering. And so if you looked at it, you could think about these little bumps on either side of this deceleration as a shoulder. And then severe de variable deceleration is you still have variability, but you're having very deep, very long decelerations. So if you could look look at this on a fetal monitoring strip, you would see that that variable um, nadirs around 70 and then it comes up and you have a huge shoulder and then it's going to drop back down. That huge shoulder is basically the baby's recovery time. So if you think about decelerations, think about holding your breath and during, so you're having this deceleration. A deceleration is um, decreased oxygenation and no uh, potentially no oxygenation to that baby. So think about holding your breath and when you hold your breath for a long time, what do you do? All of a sudden you go <gasps> and you take a deep breath. So when you take those deep breaths, that's what you can associate with this high shoulder that you see um, following these deep decelerations. Um, the, with severe variable decelerations, 
they're typically you know they have a very low depth and um, the duration is longer than one minute persistent variable decelerations may lead to acidosis to your baby and also fetal distress so those are some things that you definitely want to be watching out for when you are looking at fetal monitoring um, other fetal monitoring patterns that you can look at um, again we have a nice reassuring pattern so we're falling within our normal range and when you're looking at fetal monitoring strip it has a nice little colored area looking at normal range and you have an acceleration so an acceleration is um, an increase by 15 beats for at least 15 seconds above the baseline. So when you're looking at a baseline, um, determine your baby's baseline, maybe, um, I can't really see it on this one, but say maybe it's 130, and then you have the acceleration up to 160, and then you're gonna come back down to your baseline. So when you're looking at reassuring patterns, looking at variability, we wanna see accelerations last for 15 beats for 15 seconds or more when you're looking at um, the baseline in comparison to that acceleration. When you're looking at this pattern over here, you can call this fetal tachycardia, and you can see it's consistently running above 160 beats per minute. So um, baseline fetal heart rate is above 160. Um, possible onset of decreased variability because we're not really seeing many bumps or jags in that. Um, it's typically due to fetal lacking nourishment um, or nourishing blood supply. And so sometimes you might see if women use um, illicit drugs or um, tributylene or brethine can elevate and cause fetal tachycardia. So you need to find out what mom's taking or what maybe mom has taken and look at that. Um, we have early decelerations, which we didn't talk about on the last slide, and early decelerations, the onset and return of the deceleration coincides with the start and end of the contraction. So with early decelerations, they almost kind of mirror the contraction, um, and decelerations are associated with fetal movement, stimulation, and uterine contractions. Um, so when you're looking at um, early decelerations, typically um, the decelerations really kind of just mirror the contractions, and um, you can be noting, noting those. And then again, our late decelerations, but we do have some variability in here. Um, variability is reassuring, um, it lets us know that the baby is getting oxygen and getting nourishment that way, but we don't really like to see them persistent. Um, but with late decelerations and preserved variability, that fetal heart rate again is starting to come down at the peak of the contraction. It's going to nadir um, after the contraction, so its lowest point is going to be after the contraction has ended, and then it's going to gradually come back up. Um, late late decelerations are associated with utero utero placental insufficiency or decreased uterine blood flow so that again that's holding your breath that's like that baby holding its breath and then once the contraction has relieved then we're getting better perfusion to our placenta baby's getting oxygen and then we're going to see that heart rate um, come up and our baby start to perk up these are the videos that I've talked about. You can link them up here, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, or you can go to your ICCOC, go under Unit 4, and they'll be located under External Fetal Monitoring under there. If you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Bring your questions to class, shoot me an email, write me a note, um, and I will get them discussed so that our information is clear and not cloudy. Thanks for listening.